and welcome to Library Connection. I'm your hostess, Mandy Cantrell. This is the year 2016, it's hard to believe, and I hope all of you are getting your new calendars out and planning your events, things you're going to be doing in the coming year. And at the Comer Library, we certainly hope you will make our brown bag series one of those things you put on your calendar. Joining me today is our director, Dr. Shirley Spears. Thank you for joining me today. <laughs> Mandy, I'm glad to be here and uh, looking forward to the series and looking forward this morning to talking about it. Good. And I know you are glad because you love to talk about this. I do. <laughs> this series is the um, Take Me Back in Time is the mm -hmm. title of the series. That's a great title. I liked it. I really did. Oh, good. Well, we'll just go ahead and get started because I know everybody's wondering what, what we're having this time. The very first program is Wednesday, January 13th, Buddy Simpkins and Friends, The Best of Jazz and More. Always a favorite. Well, it's always a good thing to kick off, I think, with music because, uh, you know, it's dre uh, January and February is the most popular months that we have for a brown bag because the weather is dreary, yeah. it's usually sort of cold, and people are tired of being, uh, they're, you know, they're through with the holidays. Yes. We've, you know, we're coming down off that sugar high. <laughs> that's and true. And they're ready to get out and do something that's a little bit stimulating intellectually and also to see their friends, maybe that they haven't seen since before Christmas. Yeah haven't gotten together with them since the Christmas concert that we had. Right. So it's just a pleasure for us to offer something this good to bring people together for food and for fun and for fellowship. It's wonderful. Good. Well, we have some slides that we can show of mm -hmm. our guests, of Buddy and the group. Um, tell us about this one. Well, it's just a wonderful photograph there of the three main uh, characters in the scenario. We do have a piano player that's not shown there, but Bo Beery okay. on the trumpet. A little guy from Birmingham who's a pro. He's quite famous throughout the nation. And then you have Cleve Eaton who really, really is a famous bass player. And he is a showman. He really is. He just makes a show that he participates in. And then I just really at this time would like to just do a little tribute to Buddy Simpkins there playing the drums because if it were not for Buddy, it would be extremely difficult for us to have this program because he does the leg work on it. He knows these guys. They like him. They respect mm -hmm. him. And they come basically for him. He asks and lines up everybody, and you start lining up four people. You know oh, how it is to line yes. up people. <laughs> and then a little bit later, we'll see our vocalist, Eleanor Spencer. Right. And we don't have a picture of the piano player, but his name is uh, Brian Thomas, and he's from Birmingham, and he okay. is a really, really good pianist. Right. Go ahead and show um, the next mm -hmm. picture. Let's see. Yeah, oh, there, that, he yeah, is. there he is. There he didn't is. realize right. we had a photograph of him, but he's a wonderful pianist. And we usually use Kermit Orr from Goodwater, but he has some health issues right now, so uh, Brian was gracious enough to agree to come and fill in mm -hmm. for us, and I, I don't think he'll really be a fill-in. I think he's a star himself, mm -hmm. so we're always lucky to have good musicians and, and to have this time together. Yeah, though there's Elnor Spencer. Oh, she's marvelous. She really is, and she goes back, and she's in the Alabama Blues Hall of Fame. In 2014, she was inducted. And uh, so she's quite a singer. She sings songs from other eras. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've got you under my skin and take me to the moon and all those things that Favorites. a lot of people, I mean, people my age love it, people your age love yes. it. And we have a lot of retirees at our brown bag. So they really love to be carried back in time with these songs because you can just see their faces, that they're, they're reliving a moment. Maybe it's when they had, their husband was their boyfriend. Maybe. Or the romantic time in their life or some of the good times in their life when they were active socially or mm -hmm. just another time. Mm -hmm. And so Take Me Back in Time is such a great title for looking at history. It really is right. such a good generic title for it. Well, we look forward to that program. There's nothing like live music, and mm -hmm. this is wonderful. I've well, been to this program. Let me make clear, too, that what they do is they don't have the capability of coming together to rehearse, oh. but they're all wonderful professional musicians, so what they do is they come together and they play anything they want to for about 50 <laughs> minutes to an hour. Great. And what they come up with is just spectacular because it's the tried and the true. Mm -hmm. It's the things they all know. So that's the way that program goes. It's not a rehearse thing. It's a jam session. Oh, how fun. And it is so fun. It really is. I encourage everybody to come out for that. Good, good. The next Wednesday is January 20th. It's Nancy Anderson, and she'll be talking about the controversial Zelda Sayer Fitzgerald. Well, you know, uh, every once in a while I slide a literary program in or something from <laughs> literature, and uh, we have a following that we have some wonderful readers in this area, and they, you know, they know the Scott Fitzgerald books, and they know about that tumultuous marriage between uh, Zelda and Scott Fitzgerald and 
all the excesses of the age, the flapper age, and the drinking, and the partying, and <laughs> all the things that went on. But the story that she will focus on is that she's kind of uh, focusing on Zelda and looking at some of the things that she tried to do sort of on her own. Like she tried music, she tried dance, she tried painting. But she also will give the background and the story of Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald and the kind of life that they lived, which was really flamboyant. But she was a Supreme Court Justice from Alabama's daughter. Okay. And she was a big, uh, uh, she was a member of the, the larger society in Montgomery. So she met him as a young lieutenant at the uh, air base there. And her family wasn't interested in her marriage, marrying some young nobody from up north or from somewhere else. And right. so that was kind of, he fell for her hard and promised her that he was going to be somebody. And she did not marry him until This Side of Paradise was published. And it was obvious okay. that he really was an author that was going to make it. She boarded a train, went north, and they married. And then from then on, it was one great big party with lots of drinking, lots of partying, just a life of excess mm -hmm. almost there. And most people understand that that's the kind of story that the Fitzgerald story is. Mm -hmm. But Nancy's bringing a couple of paintings by her, and she's going to showcase some of her things. And she's going to address the question, did Zelda really have talent? Oh. Or was she in the public eye because of her husband? That's kind of what she'll be looking at. And I'm interested because I really don't know. I don't know whether she was truly talented or whether she was on the coattails of a famous husband. But That's it's going to be an interesting program. And Nancy's wonderful. She's been coming for us for probably 25 years. Oh. Uh, she's been coming for many years. She's at AUM, and she is a wonderful, talented. Uh, she teaches uh, literature. Mm -hmm. She's written, she's researched, she's published, so she is a really good presenter. Right. It'll, be a, good, it'll be a good program. She knows our audience. She knows. Oh, she does. She Wonder. knows the audience. She really does. Well, the next Wednesday, January 27th, is Daniel L. Hallman killing Yamamoto, the American raid that avenged Pearl Harbor. I thought this one was interesting. And you know, I was so excited about being able to line up some World War II programs. And I have a friend who does programs or arranges a lot of programs, and he is the former historian at the um, Air University there, and his name is Warren Trest. Yes. He's been for us. He brought Governor Patterson, right. you know, did his biography and everything. So I called Warren and told him, I said, I want some World War II programs. Will you help me locate something really good? So he sent me two names, and one of those names was Daniel Hallman. Okay. And <clears throat> he is there at uh, the Air University. He has a a role there, and he works with the 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 uh, actually the historical uh, area of the university there, the Air University. Right. And he's published books. And one of the things that he's kind of famous for is the killing of Yo uh, Yamamoto. Okay. And I thought I picked. He had several things that he had written. Yeah. He'd written on the Tuskegee Airmen and some different subjects that we've had before. But I thought, you know, the killing of Yamamoto was one of the most important things that occurred during World War II because when you, he, he, he planned Pearl Harbor. Uh, he was the strategist, the main strategist between, uh, on Japanese warfare. Mm -hmm. And President Roosevelt, um, you know, felt that it was real important to uh, uh, do something that was, you know, we needed to get the mastermind yes. behind yes. all that was going on with the Japanese mm -hmm. and the suicide bombings and that kind of thing. So this is a great story. It is wonderful because it was such a partnership of the code breakers, okay. all branches of the service. This was a huge undertaking that's just like something out of espionage history. Oh, really? <laughs> and they intercepted a flight and killed him. Okay. It was a miracle to, mm -hmm. to kill the main strategist behind the Japanese warfare. So this is going to be a great story, I Good. think. And I, it's one that I really never have heard. I, I don't know a lot and, about it. Well, you know, I'm a history it. major, and I pride myself on having heard about a lot of different things in history. I don't remember mm -hmm. them, but I've heard of them. <laughs> right. But I thought, you know, I never have heard the story of how we actually apprehended and killed the main person. So mm -hmm. I think that will be really good. A bit of the behind the scenes uh -huh. maybe there. That's great. Uh, the next Wednesday, we're into February. February 3rd is James Hansen, Robert Trent Jones, and the Making of Modern Golf. You know, I really, really have thought for several years about having this program because I knew that Dr. Hanson had done work with the <clears throat> Trent Jones. He'd done the history and the man, uh, Robert Trent Jones. He was an immigrant, a British immigrant. Okay. And he wanted to be an architect and work with golf courses. 
and came to America. And uh, Cornell University made up a curriculum specifically for him. And he was trained to uh, build golf courses. So just his, his part, uh, his personal philosophy and him as a man is a wonderful story. Mm -hmm. But then to look at the fact that he's built like 42 golf courses in the United mm -hmm. States, 28 all over the world. Very popular. And that he has some of the most fabulous, appealing, beautiful golf courses. But not only that, he has some of the most difficult. Oh. And so his philosophical stance is make them, make them difficult, but make them beautiful. Mm -hmm. And so for Alabama, it's been life changing yes. for this state to have those mm -hmm. golf courses, the Robert Trent Jones Golf Trail. Mm -hmm. Dr. Henson is actually, uh, um, he's a, uh, an expert in aeronautical history. And he did the only authorized biography of Neil Armstrong. Oh, he has been to the library and he did <clears throat> Sputnik for me. Um, he did uh, the Neil Armstrong story before Neil Armstrong died. Mm -hmm. And for him to be the, do the only authorized biography and have the behind the scenes story on Neil Armstrong, that was a fabulous oh, uh, program, it really was. So his book is just uh, out, and it's, uh, I don't remember exactly what the name of it. It's something about... Uh, uh, okay. First Man? Uh, or well, a that was... The, that a was difficult a, par, a Robert difficult Trent Jones, par. Jones Sr. Now, First Man was Neil Armstrong. Yes, okay. But this difficult par is his new book that's just out. So I thought, hey, this is a good time for me yes. to have him. He has a new book out, and he can bring his book, and he can tell his story. So I'm excited about having Dr. Henson. Mm -hmm. He is actually the head of the Honors College at Auburn University in okay. the History Department. So he is um, respected and revered at Auburn University, and he's quite a scholar. And he's also, he does, he'll have pictures and photographs, right. and he'll do a good program. Good. I think good. the guys will like it, and the women too. Oh, I think so. Mm -hmm. Everybody plays golf, seems <laughs> It does, great. it seems that way. Well, we're about halfway through, and before we go to a commercial break, let's talk about um, the, the actual, the schedule of the programs. Mm -hmm. I mean, you come at 11 for light refreshments. Right. And that's a wonderful time to so socialize mm -hmm. with your friends. Uh, we have a wonderful, um, a wonderful group of ladies who volunteer to. to we do. Off. I'm telling you, they're, with they're fabulous. We wouldn't have the series that we have if we didn't have. Uh, uh, Miss Donna Dickey has yes. always sort of. She's been on the library board. This is her 40th year, oh, yeah. and she she sort of heads up and orchestrates the refreshments. Yes. And then we have anywhere from six to eight women who come in and see that everybody's comfortable, that they have something to drink, that they have sweets, desserts. And then, uh, theoretically, the participants bring a sandwich. Yes. And then, you know, you see so many couples. You'll see a man and a wife, mm -hmm. or maybe it'll be somebody with uh, their adult children. You know, this is an adult series. And right. they have the best time in the high tower room before they go over to hear the program. And so that has become a, a wonderful social time for our town and a, a good fellowship type time where people network. I think that's an important role for a library. Is to, you're, and looking at the roles that have been published lately, one of the things we try to do is connect people mm -hmm. and connect people with the community and connect people with each other. With it's each a other. tremendous right. role that the public library plays. Right. Refreshments at 11 and the program begins at 12. If you're coming on a lunch hour, it's about an hour, mm -hmm. something like that. So I noticed that quite a few people come from their place of work and uh, they'll sort of slide in late and sit in the back and maybe they slide out a little bit early right. and you know get on out a little bit to, to get back to work and we encourage that. We don't mind. It's not a, it's not a distraction for us because it's uh, it's a great thing for working people to have access. It, is. it really is. Yeah, We're really glad. Nice We're break. really glad. <laughs> well, we'll take a quick break for commercials and hope you'll join us after the break. In central Alabama, 9,100 kids face going to bed hungry tonight. Hunger doesn't take a day off. There are kids right here, right now, that don't know where they'll get their next meal. Join Alabama Childhood Food Solutions and help put an end to childhood hunger in central Alabama. Make a difference. Donate today, by mail or online, to help ACFS feed hungry kids. There's no better time to share than now. Their next meal could come from you. Any meal, any time, it's a Huddle House on Highway 280. From the popular Huddle House signature waffle to our big house breakfast, including gravy and biscuit and loaded hash browns, it's a Huddle House. Try our Philly cheese steak omelet. It's a sure hit, too. Our big house sandwich combos include Huddle Burger and country fried steak. And for lunch or dinner, it's the often requested chop steak with mushroom gravy. Starting to get hungry? Head to the Huddle House. Our friendly and experienced team await you. Huddle House, Highway 280, any meal, anytime. 
At Marple City Pharmacy, we're more than just a drugstore. Our gift shop boasts some of the most unique treasures you'll find anywhere. Come in and browse the vast selection of jewelry, purses, clothing accessories, and crafts. Let our friendly staff help you find that special card or gift for any occasion. Our dollar wall features selected sale items, and we stock a wide variety of specialty items. And if it is a drugstore you need, Marble City Pharmacy was named the 2015 McKesson National Pharmacy of the Year. Visit us today at Marble City Pharmacy. Since 1935, the Collins family has been the automobile business in Sylacauga. Bobby and Anderson Collins carry on that tradition today at Stop and Shop Auto Sales. Select from late model cars, trucks, and SUVs. And our vehicles do not go on the lot until they are thoroughly inspected by our experienced mechanics. At Stop and Shop Auto Sales, we offer a 30-day warranty on all our inventory. Family owned and operated for four generations. Stop and Shop Auto Sales, 230 West 1st Street in Sylacauga. Hello and welcome back to Library Connection. I'm um, Mandy Cantrell, your hostess, and I'm joined by our Library Director, Dr. Shirley Spears. We're talking about the Brown Bag Series, Take Me Back in Time. We've covered the first four Wednesdays, and now we're on to the next one. <laughs> we'll get started. Wednesday, February 10th, is Ben Severance, Orators of States' Rights, Practitioners of Total War, Alabama's Congressional Leadership in 1863. Okay. Now, at this time, I would like to say, Mindy, that um, I encourage, this will go almost as fast as many are doing it now. That eight programs will pass by so fast. <laughs> I encourage people to put their, uh, we send these out. I encourage people to put yes. these on their refrigerator and don't make your dental appointments on Wednesday and your doctor's wow. appointments and all that plan to come because South First Bank is so wonderful to sponsor oh, this series. Right. And they've been sponsoring mm -hmm. for about six years, uh, the bank has. And so we just absolutely um, are so appreciative of them doing this. And the way you can say thank you to South First Bank is to come to the programs. Yeah. The way you can say thank you to the staff and the volunteers and the months of work that goes into planning those programs is come to the programs. That's all you have to do. Yeah. It doesn't cost a dime. Right. So come enjoy. I, I want to say that before I talk about Ben Severance. Ben Severance has been to the library before. He's a young man who is a professor of history at AUM in Montgomery. Uh, he's a good speaker. Uh, he did the Civil, <clears throat> Alabama in the Civil War in photographs for me at one time. That was a fabulous program where he took the photographs from Alabamians in the Civil yes. War and told the story of Alabama's participation in the mm -hmm. Civil War. He has, been, um, he has been doing research on the election of 1863. And I know to some of you out there that does not sound too sexy, but I'm telling <laughs> you that pol the politics of the Civil War that's a very interesting topic mm -hmm. because remember that what's going on during that period of time, those early 60s, set the tone for the slaughter of over 50,000 of our citizens just a little bit later on mm -hmm. and set the tone for a war that divided our country and a, a terrible, terrible time in our history. So looking at what the Alabama delegation was like in 1863 is what he has been doing. Okay. And he's saying that uh, uh, people may think that Alabama politics were, they didn't have much of a definition of themselves and they may not have been very committed <clears throat> to the concept of war, but in reality they were war hawks. Okay. And you talk about states' rights and you talk, now this is his, his concept, I'm not necessarily saying it's mine, it may be, but people talk about states' rights, we're defending states' rights, mm -hmm. and then you've got people over here that say, well, you know, there were other issues on the table and that a lot of people were just wanting to go to war to preserve a way of life. So with whichever way you lean with that, you can look at what somebody has studied. Yes. Uh, they look at the original documents. They look at the primary sources. Mm -hmm. They study the election. They look at what was said. Then he comes back in with this program that says, Orators of States' Rights, Practitioners of Total War. Mm -hmm. So this is what he's saying about this delegation of men. I think that's an interesting way to approach a story, and a story about pre-Civil War times. Yes. So I'm hoping that people will come on out and put their thinking caps on and really uh, listen to Ben, because he's a really, he's a nice looking man, young man, and he's so talented, and it'll yes. be so much fun to hear his yes. story and what he has found out with his research. Interesting. So that's kind of the way that program will good, go. Good. He will pro he'll probably have photographs. We always learn some new things. That well, are yeah, always. I mean, I'm really excited about that program. It sounds so good, and he probably will publish a book on the same subject. Oh, good. 
The next Wednesday is February 17th, Robert Kane, The Doodle Raid, America Strikes Back. Well, the Doodle Little Raid story is just, um, um, I was so excited when I saw this name and this Rock, Dr. Robert Kane because he is actually the, uh, he, he's I think the lead historian at, at the Air University okay. there. Those military guys have titles and you know ways that they do things, but uh, he has served as staff historian before at Eglin and then at, at Maxwell and in 2010 he became the director of history there. So he has written several books on several mm -hmm. subjects, but I'll have to say the Doodle Little Raid grabbed my attention because I knew how critical that battle was. President Roosevelt had a lot of pressure on him from the American people because they were mad about Pearl Harbor. You know, to get that sneak attack, and uh, a lot of you living out there remember how angry the American people were about Pearl Harbor and, uh, you know, the things that happened during that uh, time when Japan sort of jumped the gun and surprised us. So there was tremendous pressure on the president to sort of uh, assuage the anger of the American people. That would be like sort of like 911. Yes. Mm -hmm. Where people are ready, they're ready to do something. They're upset, they're worried about what has happened, they're angry. Mm -hmm. So anyway, he charged uh, his military people to find a way to do something to strike at Japan in a way that would uh, get the attention of the Japanese because they really thought they were invincible and right. they thought that they were not vulnerable and I think that you would know that they did or they wouldn't have done such a thing as what happened at Pearl Harbor. Unless you really thought that you were invincible, you wouldn't make a move like that <laughs> no. against a country like the United States. So anyway, it was kind of, he you know, pulled together people and it was one of the first times, it probably was the first time, that the Ar Army Air Force, as it was called then, and the Navy put their strengths together and started trying to find a way to really strike at Japan. Okay, it was a huge problem because there was no way to get close enough to the Japan's homeland mm -hmm. to actually do an attack there without endangering the ships, the uh -huh. American ships that were, you know, the fleets. So when they started putting their heads together, Hap Arnold, who was the commander decided, he turned to a controversial little guy named Jimmy Doolittle okay. and decided that he would put him in charge of this mission. Well, the Navy had a new carrier called the Hornet. And so they start planning and they go out and take a look, tour the Hornet, the, the carrier. They start looking at what kind of plane could you carry, could you launch a bomb? You can't get too close. <laughs> but you gotta get close enough to do some damage. You can't do a lot of damage, but you can do enough to get their attention and for them to understand that they are not invincible. So they came up with the, using the B-25 bombers. Okay. And they would carry a big enough load that they could hit some military uh, targets and some strategic locations there on the, the Japanese okay. homeland. And I believe it said that they launched from 500 miles out oh, okay. from that carrier. Okay, they had about, I don't know, it seemed like there were 16 or 18 of those guys. And I, can you imagine anybody, can you imagine anybody volunteering for that because they oh, knew no. they weren't coming back. <laughs> no, so no. anyway, that's yeah. a great story and it's one that we all look forward to. Well, good. We have probably five or six minutes. I mm -hmm. want to make sure we cover the last mm -hmm. two. February 24th, Catherine Braun, The Original Great Tie and How It Was Broken, Creek Indian History in Three Acts. Catherine Braun is probably one of the foremost historians of Indian history in the Southeast. Mm -hmm. uh, she's good with the trade. Uh, she's good with the treaties. And actually, the Great Tie, the original Great Tie, I kept wondering what that was and started doing a little research. And it kind of means commonly held land. Okay. And I think it was the fact that we were coexisting with the Indians mm -hmm. and all of a sudden everybody knows the story. We decided we wanted the land. Mm -hmm. And we took the land away from the Indians and the Indians, the Trail of Tears and the Indians were sent away. So she would be looking basically at uh, Creek Indian history in three acts is what she okay. calls it. And she'll sort of do an overview of that time. And I can never, ever hear that too many times. So Catherine's coming back to do that story for us. Yeah, good. It'll be good. And the very last one to wrap it all up is Wednesday, March 2nd, Dolores Hydock, always a favorite. It's The Little Things, Five Small Objects That Played a Big Role in Shaping the Dutch Golden Age. Okay, anyone <coughs> who knows Dolores knows there's no telling what she's liable to do and she's <laughs> never done anything bad. She's the best storyteller I have ever seen yes. in all of my life. I do not believe that one person in the audience would dispute that. Mm -hmm. She brings in huge crowds. Mm -hmm. 
So she basically is going to do what the title says. She says that little things have changed history. Mm -hmm. And she's going to show five small objects that have changed Dutch history, and she's going to tell exactly how that happened. You will be fascinated. You will be thrilled. As one person said, uh, Vicki Miller, our foundation yeah. president, said, I've laughed, I've cried. <clears throat> I've experienced every emotion in the book listening to Dolores Haddock. That's Haddock. true. Come out and hear Dolores' story because it is fabulous. Come out to all the programs because you can't judge them without coming. You can think, well, I may want to see two of them. You really want to see all eight of them. If you don't believe it, come and see. You do. You do. Mm -hmm. And you can go on our website. You can come by the library and pick up a schedule mm -hmm. of the programs. You can check our website. Uh, it is. At the, it's like the beautiful brochure. You can just... Yeah. You can just plug in. Yes, please do. Please come. Um, we have just a couple of minutes left. Uh, we're uh, to change gears for just a moment. We're also doing a Relay for Life fundraiser at the li library. We have a beautiful Alabama quilt. There it is, made by Rilla Blaylock. Mm -hmm. Beautiful quilt, and you may buy or. For a dollar, you can put your name in. You know, kind of like buying a chance to win that. We're going right. to give it away March the first. So please come by the light. She is library. a master quilter. She really is. It's a beautiful quilt. And our team is called the Cure is Overdue. Isn't that yes. wonderful <laughs> to use a good library term? So we would really like to sell. We, we want to have a good team and we want to contribute to a wonderful cause wow. uh, on research for cancer cure. So if people will come by the library, it takes just a minute to put their name and telephone number yes. down and get a chance at this quilt because she's Rilla wouldn't mind me saying she's 88. I don't know if she'll ever do another beautiful quilt or not, but it's, one, it's the prettiest quilt I've ever seen. It is beautiful. beautiful. It is beautiful. I'm an Auburn fan, but it is a beautiful, beautiful quilt. quilt. And she does Auburn quilts too, but this one, this is the time for the Alabama oh, quilt. Oh, I know. Now, I'm it an is. Auburn fan too. I know. <laughs> but it is the time. I love this quilt. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, we do. I think I hurry this along too, too quickly. Is there anything else we'd like to say? We've already... Of course, thank our well, sponsors. Well, I, South I just want so to glad. say again how much I appreciate South First Bank, yes. and also mm -hmm. how much I appreciate other uh, entities that help us with this. It's just such a partnership because I know the Coastal Battle Medical Center has always helped oh, us yes. a lot with all of our refreshments and all of our food. But for South First Bank to make a commitment to us, mm -hmm. and and they have a commitment to us to sponsor our speakers, that allows you to look for the high quality people yes. that you can bring in. Mm -hmm. So without these people to help us pay the bill, to bring in the cakes and the cookies, and we have so many lay people that bring in refreshments for us. So, yes. And then it's just incredible how much effort it takes to do this for a town. And you can't do it by yourself. Mm -hmm. So you have people <laughs> that'll bring drinks or they'll bring chips or things like that. And that's appreciated, but you don't have to. Right. And we do offer books for sale occasionally. <clears throat> you don't have to buy a book. You just have to come and be prepared to enjoy yourself. So it's one of the greatest pleasures that we've been experiencing for over 20 years at the Comer Library is to offer learning and fellowship mm -hmm. and fun. And I've seen people just, I've seen it just change lives. Right. The community is a different community with these kinds of activities going on all over. Dinner theater, yes. lecture series. <laughs> All of those things, story times, library services, it makes a community you want to live in. It, does. it really does. It so does. I am it so does. appreciative to this television station for allowing us to come on here and showcase wow. this today, Mandy. It's wonderful what TV 47 has done for since 2000, the year 2000. Oh, almost, almost yeah, we're going into our 16th yes. year of doing this for people, so isn't that wonderful? It we is. appreciate it, it so is. much. Thank you, Vince. Easy to work with. Mm -hmm. Well, we hope you will join us for the Brown Bag Series, Take Me Back in Time, beginning Wednesday, January 13th. Uh, our mission at the library is to educate, entertain, and enrich, and I believe all of these, uh, it's our, they cover that mission very well, all the things we have. So we hope, we hope to see you at the library. Thank you for joining us.